Okay, it looks like we're ready to go, so I'll get started. <clears throat> Hi everyone, my name is Diana Stasco. I am the co-chair of the Alliance for Disability Access here at UC Berkeley, along with Mark Brindle, who is, um, uh, his uh, Zoom name is The Alliance. Um, and today we're facilitating a webinar. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, titled Campus, Transpor Campus Transportation and Emergency Evacuations for People with Disabilities, Myth versus Reality. Um, so the topic of our webinar today is um, in the event of a campus emergency such as fire, power outage, or earthquake, what resources can people in our campus community who have differences of sight, hearing, mobility, or other abilities rely on to get to safety? And how can people with disabilities get around campus more easily in general? I um, just want to mention a little bit about the Alliance before we get started. The Alliance for Disability Access is a collaborative and supportive campus staff organization that addresses the needs of UC Berkeley staff members with disabilities. Disabilities can refer to any combination of physical, psychological, learning, and medical disabilities. And we hold meetings every three weeks on Zoom and host um, events throughout the year. And I'm going to pop <coughs> a link to um, our website in the chat. So please feel free to check out our web page. And um, you can email uh, Mark or myself to be added to our mailing list for notifications of upcoming events and our meetings. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker will be uh, panelist Ben Perez. He is, um, sorry, I'm reading my notes here. <laughs> no problem. So Ben Perez is the manager of uh, physical access compliance. He's a, an alumni of UC Berkeley's College of Letters and Sciences. He has served as a member of the UC Berkeley staff since 2014. And he joined UC Berkeley administration as the campus access specialist with the Disabled Students Program developing and training staff in disability access initiatives across university programs. After working with the university leadership to establish the new DAC office, Ben now supports capital strategies and facility services as the university official responsible for physical access and ADAA uh, and CBC compliance in the built environment. And again, Ben will be discussing campus transportation for people with disabilities. So without further ado, take it away, Ben. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for having me. It's a pleasure to talk. Um, so thanks also to the Alliance for uh, hosting this event. It is a great, um, I'm glad that this resource is being made available to staff. I know that um, often staff especially can feel disconnected from some of the programs and services that the university does host that makes the campus more accessible. Um, with less kind of a centralized place to go to get this type of information. So Alliance, thank you so much for acting as one of those centralized places. Um, I guess uh, first uh, talking about transportation, um, I think it's important to note immediately that one of the largest challenges about our campus is its topography. Um, it is often, for, for those who can perceive it visually, cited as a beautiful factor for the campus. Um, it's also a daunting thing that can make it very unwelcoming to persons with disabilities, especially if uh, mobility and uh, wayfinding are challenges for you. Um, the campus has, you know, we don't have a grid layout for our pathways. Uh, so, you know, trying to find a, you know, trying to find your way, unless you're intimately familiar with with the various slight curves and subtle hills uh, is pretty difficult. Um, and I think that challenge is even harder for staff in general because unlike students who tend to bounce around from you know, building to building, semester to semester, and are kind of brought into a familiarity with the campus through that, you know, through that kind of very like, scattershot approach to which buildings they're in, staff tend to go to one place and then go from that place. And it makes it more difficult to navigate still. 
Um, so the first thing I think that's important to note is a couple of services that are specific to persons with disabilities. Um, the first is the loop, which I like to describe as Uber for people with disabilities on campus. Um, the loop is a golf cart service that runs Monday through Friday, um, 7.45 a.m. to 10 p.m. with one major limitation as it pertains to the staff in that it only runs on days that classes are in session, which means that on university holidays when students aren't here, so I'm thinking, um, you know, especially around uh, the winter curriculum and um, winter holidays, there is often a period where staff are on campus doing their work and the loop doesn't run. So that limitation aside, um, the loop offers site-to-site -site pickup and transportation on demand. Um, for staff, accessing the loop um, requires some form of verification of disability, uh, which is handled through disability management services. Uh, one of the great partners that I uh, hope you all are all already aware of on campus to support um, staff accommodations and staff with disabilities. Um, and so what somebody would do is go to the, uh, the Loop's program website, which our department hosts, but it's just loop.berkeley.edu, so L-O-O-P.berkeley.edu, and there's instructions to fill out a Google form. Um, and from there, somebody who I'll introduce in a little while, um, Thea, who is um, new to the staff as our campus access analyst and supports um, my department's operations, particularly when it comes to the loop, as well as emergency preparedness things that we'll talk about in a little while, um, receives the request and will um, and will also then you know help shepherd you through the, the verification process. So this could be for a short term injury or disability, right? If you have sudden mobility impairment due to a broken leg or some other um, some of the temporary condition, the loop is certainly something that you can and should make use of. Um, and if you're, uh, you know, whatever the limitation, functional limitation you have is, is you know, something that you expect will continue to be to affect you on an ongoing basis, then the loop access can be established for you know, your entire time on campus with no need to re-verify. Um, um, and so a couple of things about the service, you know, uh, if any of you have used it, you know that it is highly subject to uh, you know, supply and demand issues in terms of how quickly it will arrive. So students, for example, are on campus Monday through Friday, most busily on Tuesdays and Thursdays, however, and then again, most concentrated even further in the kind of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. window. Calling a ride at that point is going to take longer than it would at, you know, 6 p.m. on Thursday or Friday afternoon. Um, and so the loop, you know, it serves this kind of intra-campus purpose very well, but it doesn't much, you know, so it's, it's limited to the campus itself. The, the carts are street legal, however, for a whole host of reasons as of right now, we're constraining them to the specific pickup and drop-off locations that are pre-established. There are 37 of them across the campus, um, but there is often a need to get kind of around the campus in a broader sense. Um, and this is where we point to things that are you know, available to everybody, but I think some staff um, often don't realize are as useful as they might be. So um, campus transportation options like the uh, the campus uh, bear transit shuttles, which are free for staff use. They are accessible. They have wheelchair lifts. So if walking up the stairs is any challenge for you, um, I myself am a wheelchair user and obviously therefore stairs are not my best friend. Um, I have regularly used these lifts and have been um, you know, really pleased with how well the staff are trained to work with me as a wheelchair user, secure my chair to the back of the, uh, the back of the, sorry, not to the back of the, in the rear of the bus. Um, and then also to get me places pretty quickly. Um, the Botanical Gardens is a great example of a spot where I end up relatively frequently, but one that is not traversable by pedestrians at all. There is no safe sidewalk on your way up. But there's also um, a shuttle, the, you know, the perimeter shuttle circles the campus uh, clockwise, the reverse perimeter circles the campus counterclockwise on half hour intervals. And they cover most of the periphery of the campus such that between the loop and the perimeter, I feel like there's really good access from even from some of our remote parking spaces, um, like at the uh, Underhill uh, garage, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, beyond that, I think in case people don't know, um, and I hope that you do, um, 
if you have a campus parking permit and you also have a placard for disability, um, you're allowed to park in any campus parking spot, regardless as to whether the lot aligns with the permit type you have. So for example, most staff have uh, F permits, which allows them to park in lots that are kind of on the edge of the campus for the most part. Um, and a couple of them that are, you know, somewhere, you know, closer, but they're certainly not the coveted C of parking permits that are, you know, in the very middle of the campus, right next to the buildings where you actually probably want to be. Um, and so if you have a valid disabled person's parking placard and a valid campus parking permit, you can ignore the lot type restriction and park in any lot that has space for um, a disabled person parking. Um, so I encourage you to take use of that. Um, some choice lots that I like to point out to folks are um, obviously the little lot right by California Hall and the Architects and Engineers Building, just right off of, not California Hall, sorry, Sproul Hall. Um, so, you know, right by the Sproul Plaza. Um, there are a couple of parking spaces right next to the Social Sciences Building. Uh, if you turn right off of Barrows Lane, there are a couple of, um, of accessible parking spaces there. At the Campanile, there are several accessible parking spaces, as well as right by Bechtel Engineering Center. Um, so these are, you know, kind of more central. And I, again, strongly encourage staff to take use, to make use of that provision in our policy, because it greatly increases your flexibility when it comes to finding places to be. Um, last place to point out is outside of South Hall, um, which is, you know, right next to the um, Bancroft Library as well. Um, so between, you know, those, those three major programs, there is, I think, a decent amount of additional mobility and, and transportation option for staff. Um, and, you know, I encourage anybody with questions about this to email our department at access at berkeley.edu um, so that you can either learn more or get some specific assistance relative to your individual needs and your individual, the barriers that you individually face. Because I think that we all, I hope that we're all aware that, you know, the process of managing facility is a deeply individualized process and your needs in terms of where you need to go and when you need to be there could greatly change, you know, your relationship to these types of programs. Um, and as always, you know, things are, are more flexible than they may appear. If you have a specific need, you know, there, there's always a way to work through it. Um, so, you know, let us know how we can best support you. Um, one thing to note that is also just a constraint on the university's ability to provide transportation for staff. The university has long held that it is an individual responsibility, whether an individual's responsibility, whether that's a student or a staff member, to get to the campus. But once you're on the campus, the university does bear significant responsibility for making sure that you can get to the places you need to be. Um, so I would say, you know, get yourself here and then we, we, you know, the campus will figure out how to support um, the rest of your mobility needs. Um, so I'm gonna actually uh, turn it over to Thea and my colleague, Garrett Coates, both of whom are a work with the Disability Access Compliance Office um, as a way of introduction. Um, Thea, as I mentioned, joined us recently as a campus access analyst. Thea is a graduate of UC Berkeley's um, School of Social Welfare with a master's in social work and um, it has been an invaluable asset to our office in this short time. Um, Derek uh, has been on campus for, I wanna say 14 years. If I'm, if I'm speaking incorrectly, Derek, please uh, let me know. Um, Derek has served in roles in HR investigations and is currently the manager of uh, program access compliance, overseeing the campus's compliance efforts in our non-physical programming. So everything else. Um, so I wanted to turn it over to these two so we can start talking about emergency preparedness, unless there are any questions. Yeah, um, is, is there are, let's see if there's any questions first about what was just presented before uh, I go into what I'm doing. What yeah, doing. thank Absolutely. you. We would, we would like to um, just take a brief, uh, you know, period to, to ask any questions. And thank you so much, Ben. That was super informative. I really got a lot out of that. And I actually had a question. Um, yeah regarding um, the uh, ability to park in C lots in disabled parking spots. Um, mm -hmm. So with the disabled permit, 
parking in lots that are not like as staff parking in lots that are not F lots, are you only allowed to park in disabled parking spots? Or can you park in any spot if you have a disabled placard? Similar to, similarly to like being on the street. Yeah, um, you can park in any spot. I think that the intention of the policy is to give you access to additional disabled persons parking spaces, the blue spaces that are marked throughout the campus. But if there aren't any available in the lot that you need to park in, absolutely, you can use the most convenient available space um, that is 100% all right. Um, one important thing to note though, and I just stress this over and over and over again, is that you do need to have a valid campus parking permit. So the difference being that the campus is not public parking. We are you know, our own separate entity that is allowed to control our parking and we require a permit of some kind, but even with a day pass, so you know, not even a, you know, not even a, you know, a daily parking permit, just a day pass that you purchase from parking and transportation, you can then take that day pass and park in a C lot as long as you have a placard. Got it. And then um, after hours parking, I personally am not super familiar with that, but I understand that it's paid parking for some lots and areas of campus. Oh, it's a mess. That's kind of what I thought. <laughs> Could you go into that and how there might be any special like allowances for people with disabilities and how that might work. Yeah. So actually, you know, there really isn't any, there's no additional specific allowance as an accommodation for disability in this parking, in our parking program as it exists. If it's not a paid lot, you know, in the after hours parking. So, you know, usually they'll say from 5 p.m. till 2 a.m., you know, this is open to the public and it's paid or not paid. That's usually what I've seen is the changeover. Um, if it says it's not paid, then you don't have to pay. If it says it's paid, you need to pay, um, or you need to have a valid permit. But again, as long as the permit is valid, it does not need to line up with the lot requirements for permit type. So as somebody with a with a disabled person's parking placard, choose whichever lot works best for you based on your need, and then comply with whatever permit requirement exists in, insofar as having one or not. Um, and that will just apply at all times. Um, if there's a specific need for an individual who's having a really difficult time finding parking that works for them, they have a disabled placard, they have a disability known to management and known to the university, then we can work with you on figuring something out that will, that will meet your needs on an ongoing basis. Um, but that is something that is reserved for an instance where just there's a breakdown in, you know, for example, if your office is adjacent to just a heavily impacted lot, and it doesn't seem to matter what time you show up, you just cannot get parking that works and everything else is too far away, then you know, we can work on finding some solution there. But that would be an individualized thing worked through with my office directly. Um, otherwise, yeah, just whatever's posted. Great, thank you. I mean, I guess I will okay. mention as a person who does have a placard, sometimes I just find it easier to park on the street because I found the campus parking rules and configurations to be so confusing and I, I always know that I can park on the street with my placard. So being lucky enough to work you know just slightly off of campus that's usually my solution. But I'd love to hear any comments from anyone else or any thoughts from you. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame you in the slightest is all I can really say. I hope I hope this conversation helps people feel a little more comfortable with the idea that they can if you have a placard, find the parking that works best and run with it. Um, but um, yeah, don't blame me at all. It's a mess, it's difficult. It's difficult for people to understand who don't have to take their own functional limitations and limits into mind. You know, people get oopsies tickets all the time for not understanding, um, but hopefully this helps elucidate it at least for, at least for this group of people. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone, I'd love to hear from anyone else if anyone else has any questions. Oops, sorry, for Ben. Either on the loop or parking or other transport. And also remember the campus shuttles are also accessible. So yeah, um, that's yeah. also a resource. And and free to staff, right? You know, and supposedly there's a dollar charge if you don't have a staff or student ID. I've never seen them levy that charge, you know, so don't worry too much about it. 
And um, people can find out about the campus shuttles on the campus transportation website, yep. or is that, would that be under D, the DAC website? So on, on the DAC website, if you go to Navigating Cal, which is one of the options at the top of our, um, of our website uh, in the drop-down menus, there are links for a couple of resources that I should have pointed out at the beginning. Thank you very much, Hannah, for mentioning that. Um, there are links to the campus parking transportation shuttle services, so you can just start on our page to find that info. There are links of the accessible pathways and accessible entrances to all the buildings on campus. Um, there is a link to um, information about the loop. Um, there is a link to parking policies, which describes the, which, you know, where, where the policies that I just described are housed, so you can read it for yourself or forward it to anybody who has questions. Um, and um, yeah, so th that's all there, um, you know, dac.berkeley.edu and then navigating Cal, which is one of the menu options at the top. And um, newer and more updated maps will be rolling out over the course of forever, probably, as we change the campus and have capacity to make those updates. Thank you. Okay, um, and what and, if uh, people have questions, issues, concerns? Do yeah. they go to our website? And what, can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, so uh, at Derek's brilliant prompting, um, there are a couple of ways to best get in contact with us. If you have any specific questions, uh, the best way to get in contact is to email access at berkeley.edu. Um, and it'll get routed internally until the right person can get back to you. Um, if you, however, have an issue of concern, that is to say you see something that either a practice or a, you know, a physical barrier or anything that you feel needs attention from the DAC office and our team, you can um, go to the request services button, which is on our homepage. And there is a link to a Google form where you can describe the nature of what you're seeing. It's very open-ended and they'll let you get hopefully uh, to whatever the most specific concern that you have is. Um, it's also the place where if you see a physical access barrier in the built environment of our campus, that you can report it. Um, and those reports are routed to me and then it is my job to try to make those issues go away as quickly as I can. I'd like to point to examples of where that has, you know, been pointed out and addressed. So, you know, um, recently a student pointed out that there was some broken uh, concrete at the top of the ramp, and I was able to at least get that project initiated. So we're in the process of removing that barrier already. Um, if you see something that is inaccessible, or if you see a practice that is inaccessible, or if you have a question, or again, just a concern that you want to raise, um, dac.berkeley.edu and then the request services button it's uh, on the home page great if no one else has a question i actually have another question please yeah so i know for me sometimes the issue is knowing which entrances to a building i can easily <clears throat> access or you know am i going to have to go up a bunch of stairs and things like that Yep. So I'm wondering if if a map exists, show it would be a great thing if it did, showing where those entrances are so that, you know, if I want to get to an office on the other side of one of the large buildings, which is the quickest entrance for me to get there um, and easy. Absolutely. Thing. Yeah. So again, under the Navigating Cal tab, there's a, a section for maps and um, that section includes a map that says uh, preferred wheelchair routes. And I really realized as we're talking that I should name it accessible entrances also. Um, but on that map are um, blue lines, which indicate barrier free routes in terms of stairs. So I cannot guarantee that the slope of every single pathway is compliant, although they are the most accessible paths across our campus. And then um, it also includes red dots indicating the accessible entrance for every building on the campus. Um, you know, um, except for apparently um, formerly Crover, now so, uh, now anthropology and art practice, which while looking at the map, I just realized does not have a red dot indicating where it's accessible entrance is. That'll be fixed soon. Um, I've stared at this thing thousands of times. I cannot believe I never saw that until now. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, so that map is there, it exists. I encourage you to make use of it. Um, I know that, especially if you're going to a, a facility that you're unfamiliar with, which 
again, if you're usually working one location and suddenly you're going to an event or to a training or to an HR function somewhere else, completely understandable that you would not know how to get there and not know what the accessibility features of that space are. Um, and so, yeah, that's what this resource is aiming to help provide. Um, so yeah, there, um, there, that map exists. I'm sorry, can you repeat again where, uh, what, under what tab or where, where that came yeah. from? Um, if you go to Navigating Cal, which is the one of the tabs at the top of our website, and then Maps, it'll show up there. Great, thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions or comments? I will say that having some, like, it seems like this information is kind of spread out in disparate, somewhat disparate locations. And I'm wondering, especially for people who are visitors to campus, who, you know, may not have the time to navigate all these different resources, if there's like some kind of a quick handout or even handout and video that if aren't created, might be created to help people just quickly get an overview or even a deeper dive into how to get around. Yeah, I think that um, there's a couple, you touched on a couple of really important things, all of which I think are known to the campus and there's a building consensus that we have to do, we have to do something to address some of these shortfalls. So for example, um, you're right, everything is really disparately located. I'm deeply displeased with the fact that there are multiple maps that a person with a disability must kind of have internalized in order to navigate the campus, layered on top of just where they are and what the name of the building they're going to is and what the pathway they're on, you know. What you, so in addition to the wayfinding questions, you know, for a wheelchair user, um, for example, you might need to know where the accessible paths are, but on top of that, the relative slope of those paths, the accessible entrances, as well as parking that's accessible and um, and or other side arrival points that meet your access needs. And that's like, you know, four or five layers of map information um, on top of, you know, what other people are really required to maintain. So we're working towards as a part of the campus master plan, long range development plan effort spearheaded by the um, by uh, UC Berkeley's physical and environmental planning group on creating wayfinding and other, you know, access tool just info uh, to make it much more reachable, perceivable, to make the information accessible. And then finally, my last push is to make that information, instead of only hosting it on the disability compliance site, to embed it in the site that actually, that, that visitors go to by default, right? Um, so to make sure that the main campus map incorporates as much of this information as possible. That effort is actively underway. That's great. Thank you so much. We'll really uh, look forward to seeing more of that information and hopefully we can link to that from the staff disability, um, the uh, Alliance for Disability Access webpage. And thank you so much, Ben. I think we, um, I personally got a lot out of that and I hope everyone else did too. Um, Wonderful. So thank you for sharing all your expertise. And at this point, we will now be moving on to Derek Coates and Sia Chun um, discussing emergency evacuation planning for people with disabilities or those individual consultations on our presentation. Um, so a little bit, actually, Ben already introduced, I believe, Derek and Thea. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> maybe without without further introduction, you folks can go ahead and get started on your talk. Thank you. Sounds good. Um, Anthea, can you screen share that uh, Google Slides presentation? Yeah, so can everybody see um, the presentation I'm sharing right now, which is called Emergency Evacuation Planning for Individual Consultation? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And I've gone ahead and closed my video because I'm seeing more than one screen, so I never know where to look. Um, but I'll be um, I'll be uh, handling the the slide deck portion. So go ahead, Derek. 
Okay, and so the transportation piece gives us a great segue into um, the self-evaluation that's taking place on campus. So this hopefully will not be the first time people get exposed to information about how to um, successfully um, navigate the campus. Um, with the self-evaluation that was part of the transition plan uh, project that was completed earlier this year, and uh, one of the things that will be happening is I'll be traveling around to the various control units on the campus and providing people with support information for that. Um, also, we will be providing an LMS training later in the year, probably in the spring, that will also be available. So that sort of will address the issues that you raised, Diana, uh, about um, a brief overview regarding um, a, sort of a snapshot that people can go to to, um, to find out more information about how to uh, navigate the campus. So in my present, in our presentation, um, first of all, I'll be providing an overview and walk people through the process um, and all of the, uh, the intricacies of emergency evacuation. And then Thea will talk about the intake form that we've developed that we have for people who might want consultations. Um, and so the idea is that uh, we provide a resource and the avenue for people who want to request an evacuation plan to develop one. Okay. All right. Um, now, the pur purpose of this workshop um, is to help people with disabilities learn how to navigate the campus using the transportation systems that we already uh, have, and also how to safely evacuate from a building. Um, and, and this is our way of defining inclusion, and that is making sure that as we talk about this information and share this information, we also include people that have disabilities so that they can learn, but also um, ask questions and participate in the process. Um, while it's the case that first responders need to uh, know how to best assist people with disabilities, there's also a lot we can do to prepare for success. Uh, I think I think the most important piece here is um, to know who, what, when, and, and, and where. Um, who needs to know? So if you're a staff person on campus, who needs to know is your supervisor and your manager? That person is gonna play a critical and key role in making sure that everyone is successful if in case there's an evacuation that's necessary. Um, what do they need to know? Everybody needs to know their role, whether we, I think the best way to think about this is that we're all on a softball field and we're all playing softball or whatever game you want to talk about that's a group game. You learn about what other, you learn about your own role based on ex being exposed to what other people are also meant to do. So in this scenario, we're talking about the manager supervisor knowing what their role is the uh, person with the disability knowing what their role is and their responsibilities, the building manager knowing what their role is, a floor warden knowing what their role is. And so everybody involved has an idea of what their role is. And that even moves to uh, the first responders to know what their role is. So if everybody's on the same page about what's supposed to happen, then um, we, we can make sure that we can, we can achieve the most success possible. Um, all right. Um, keys to success, what to do in an emergency. Um, for help in an emergency, there's a number of options that are available to people. Obviously, people can dial 911 from a campus phone. Um, they can also call uh, the UCPD number. Um, they can call the, the campus emergency hotline. Um, they can send an email um, to emergency.berkeley.edu. Um, they can use text to 911 in which they identify what the uh, issue is, the city that they're in, and uh, um, what sort of um, emergency response is necessary, whether it be police, fire, et cetera. Um, so one of the keys to success in, in this whole process is, get, is uh, having the information available, real-time information. Um, it's the best way to maximize opportunities for success. On our campus, we have a number of uh, methods by which people can get up-to-date real-time data on what's actually happening. If you don't know what's happening, you don't know whether you need to evacuate right now, whether you can wait, et cetera. And so the benefit of, of the, the um, opportunities that we have to gain real-time access to information uh, will be invaluable in, in successfully evacuating from buildings. Um, one of the first uh, options is the warn me. And if you travel to the Warn Me website, you you know everybody who has a UC Berkeley I, um, 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 
sorry, email address is automatically enrolled in uh, Warn Me. And um, most of you already have received messages about things that are taking place. And Warn Me is used whenever there's some sort of a threat that might be a threat to bodily harm or injury uh, to people. Uh, and that's engaged by UCPD. Um, so what ends up happening, you will get a text message on your smartphone phone that'll indicate where the location is of the issue, what the recommendations are regarding the issue, and, uh, and, and what, what options you have as far as uh, how to respond. Um, in addition, um, the uh, emails are sent to, uh, if that's a preference that you select, that also provide you with notice about what might be happening in a particular area. Uh, and this is definitely something that's ongoing. I think it's a great resource. For me being blind and traveling with the guide dog, it's really helpful to know where hotspots might be that I might want to avoid so that I can sort of plan an alternate route. Um, um, so emergency notifications are, are sent on a, um, upon confirmation of a significant um, emergency or dangerous situation. Um, all right. Um, so there's also the UCB um, alerting and warning system, and people have heard the sirens that get tested. Um, and that's on the, uh, the first Wednesday of every month. And uh, this siren also can serve as a PA system in which people can hear instructions that are verbally communicated to the campus um, uh, in, in, in case of an emergency. All right, keys to success access for information part two. Um, you know, in the case of an emergency, we also want to make sure that we're aware of the other options in terms of information, one of which would be radio. So uh, we have a Cal radio system, um, and we, we also want to make sure that people know that there's also a city radio stations that they can also listen to to gather information that's up to date. Um, sometimes it's more than just evacuating from a building. Sometimes it's evacuating from the campus. And so being able to know how to get access to those radio stations on your smartphone is just uh, ideal and something that could be done ahead of time that can facilitate uh, what to do whenever uh, an emergency takes place. Um, you also can register for AC Alert, and that's in the, in the county of Alameda. Um, and, um, Al um, the, and AC Alert, once you register, it can provide voice, war uh, voice notification, um, text messages, it can provide email messages, and it can e even provide information on social media. Um, another option that's available is um, uh, we have social media um, uh, portals through which emergency information can also be communicated. Um, you have UCB, uh, UCPD Facebook and Twitter accounts, but you also don't forget have the, the city of Berkeley um, uh, Twitter accounts and, and, um, and Facebook pages also to gather more information. Um, and last, we have the UCB homepage. Um, if there is an emergency, the homepage will also be a site at which you can, you can gather information to help you out, to help you make the best decisions. Okay. All right, so when we move into preparations for evacuation, um, one of the most important things is to think ahead of time in terms of what you need. Uh, what will you need in order for you to successfully evacuate? Uh, keys, wallet, X, Y, Z, right? Um, and uh, one of the wonderful things about the ADA network and many of the, uh, the, the federal uh, agency websites is that you can do an easy Google search and you can get all kinds of go bag recommendations. Um, and the idea is that you look and you figure out what is the most effective and efficient for you based on the functional limitations of your disability, the way that your disability may uh, come, play, a, play a factor and a role in your ability to successfully evacuate. And so we want people to think through ahead of time, if you have to leave in an emergency urgently, what are the core pieces and core things that you would need in order for you to successfully uh, egress from a, 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 from a building? Um, these can include emergency health information. Uh, they can, th this bag can contain uh, medical not medicines that you might need that you can't not have for a day or what or or or, or a short period of time. Um, um, having a small whistle or some sort of a whistle, some sort of a noise making device is also ideal to have. 
Um, and, and most important, if you are, have a disability that uh, requires first responders to have additional information on what, about what they need to do to assist you, sometimes it's, it's great just to have a script written, a, a three by five card, something that's written that you can hand to somebody to help them further understand uh, what they might need to do in order to assist you. Um, and, and all of these can, should be discussed with, uh, with an exit buddy. Um, Okay. All right. So um, I, I wanted to talk about the exit buddy, and um, and the the ideal is that you have one person who uh, you will have contact with that will check in on you in case there's an emergency. But I think that it's ideal to have two people. Um, and and in the example that I give about my experience later in the presentation, I'll tell you why. Um, but at the end of the day, you have one person, but that person might not be available. And so if you have a second backup person, then that's idea. Now with this exit buddy, what you want to do is you want to do your best to uh, have conversations with this person, meet this person, um, and, and, and walk through what's going to happen in case there's an evacuation. And I'll use a simple example for myself again, and that's sometimes I might need sighted guide assistance. And um, everybody is not equipped to provide sighted guide assistance, but it's not a testament about whether or not their character. It's just people may not know how to do it and they may be uncomfortable doing it. And so sometimes I might get sighted guide assistance and somebody will, will guide me as if I have a, like 200 light bulbs attached to me and one might fall and break or something. Um, just really, really gingerly. And it's like, no, we, we, we can keep walking. Sometimes people will explain what every physical thing is in the path that we're walking through as opposed to just walking through and be walking behind them. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, there's things that I can do that, that I do that will help people be more comfortable in that, in that uh, process. Um, there's also things that you can do if you have a disability and you need assistance to uh, work with that exit buddy so that they're comfortable understanding what their role is. Again, we're back to how can we best help them understand what the expectations are, uh, what they're responsible for doing, and, and do that using humor or whatever, but do that in a way that helps the team be successful. Um, so that exit buddy will also be someone who will meet with you and the building manager. Uh, it might, that person might meet with you and the floor warden. And so we want this to really be a team effort so that everybody who's engaged has an understanding about what their role is. And, and, and how to execute their responsibilities as best as possible. And we know that in emergencies, people don't think clearly. Um, there's all kinds of things going on. The siren is blaring and just drowning out every sound. And, and you know, there's anxiety. So we want to make sure that people get as comfortable as possible. And that means establishing and building a relationship with that exit buddy, with that building manager, and, and, and understanding um, um, how to interface with first responders too. Um, so um, one of the most critical pieces next is this notion of figuring out how to actually evacuate the building. Um, so that means your exit buddy, the building manager, the floor warden, um, at the end of the day, somebody has to identify what is the best route to get out of this building. Um, and that includes uh, looking at the building plans and identifying where you are relative to the designated waiting areas or areas of refuge and identifying where you will go once you leave the building. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, the, the best way to do that is to sit down and walk through what this looks like and do sort of a dry, uh, excuse me, a drill so that uh, everybody's on the same page about, you know, how are you going to go from A to B in the most effective and efficient manner. Uh, on our on our campus website, you can go. Ben referred to this earlier, and you can go onto our website and you can um, um, select the building, and you can find out information about that building all the way down to where the restrooms are. And so, uh, when I say prepare, the, the best way for us to prepare for our success is to make sure that we also do our due diligence as people with disabilities. That means. Uh, taking the time to go to that building and look at what those op uh, what the options are, what the routes look like based on the building uh, schematics. Um, and this applies not only to just uh, staff persons in buildings, but also students. Um, students may be traveling to various buildings has been referred to before because they're in different classes. And so having an idea about what those buildings are like is sort of the due diligence sort of part student can do to get a better understanding of you know what really should happen and that doesn't mean that you're going to be doing this by yourself 
again, I emphasize the team approach to this. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it helps when you're a little bit more, a, a little bit familiar with what the terrain looks like in the respective areas that you might need to evacuate from, so that in case there something does happen to the exit buddy for for uh, uh, unfortunately, you still are able to uh, to uh, uh, at least find your way to the designated wary, waiting area or area of refuge. Um, so it's a great. Oh, sorry, Ben. Did you want to add something? Oh, I was going to say, um, it would just be a good time to ask you to go over the emergency readiness competition. Right. Um, yeah, are you there? I am. So I think, um, Derek, thank you. I, so to, as an overview, if you see on your screen, these are the um, components that will be discussed during an individual consultation, which is the review of building plans, which shows the designated waiting areas. So those are areas where um, you are, where, bef where uh, um, people who uh, are disabled can go to, to await, of course, my phone starts ringing. <laughs> I apologize. Um, to go to uh, where there will be first responders to help um, and, uh, as well as that, um, you know, we'll go over if you need an evacuation chair or as Derek was saying, to um, really go over the accessible routes um, that, that you could take um, during an emergency. Um, itemizing what's needed in a go bag, like Derek was saying, in terms of extra medication, instructions for first responders and how, you know, what you need them to know immediately when they reach you. Um, also setting up, uh, as Derek was saying, text 911 and emergency notifications and also uh, scheduling a building walkthrough um, with the, you know, both us um, will be there and also with um, like the building manager um, when, it, when it's appropriate. Um, so that's the, the overview of what the consultation will um, will uh, will include when when we meet up, um, and then in terms of and then just again these are some of the terms that are used in the consultation and the individual plan that you'll receive yourselves, which uh, again the designated waiting areas for um, people who need mobility assistance to wait for an evacuation, um, evacuation assistance from first responders. And they're often located near stairways and emergency exits. And then once you're outside of the building, there are assembly areas that will be, um, that will be prepared beforehand as well so that you know uh, safe areas to assemble to once you're outside of the building. Um, and Ben, was there anything that you wanted to add to the signage around that? Yeah, um, so the campus is currently working on a project to update all of the emergency evacuation routes signage that's available in campus buildings. So I don't know if you've seen before as you enter elevator lobbies or major stairwells, you know, the, the California fire code requires that we have some signage that shows where the evacuation routes are. But right now in our buildings, those are Let's just say um, um, bespoke uh, per location. Uh, they, they are maintained by each building. And when we recognize that this needs to change in order to help with preparedness. So we are working on a project, like I said, to update all the time so that it is using the same symbols, it's using the same uh, iconography and colors, and also so that um, it's something that you can work with our office in an individual consultation to know something about the building's emergency features in advance of um, in advance of an emergency, um, you know, and tied to that effort is also a campus-wide effort to update our. So over the course of the next uh, couple of months, if um, you are a staff member with a disability known to your manager, it's possible that they might approach you to ask if you would require any evacuation assistance or any considerations unique to your needs. Um, if they don't, I would encourage you to ask your manager or supervisor about your department or building's emergency plan um, to, 
to make sure that any thing that you really need you know, in order to assure your safety is included in that plan. Um, those plans are meant to be individualized to take specific consideration for the people who are, who are actually there on site in that building. Um, uh, one note about the designated waiting area signs. So as, um, the, as one of them is currently on the screen, they say designated waiting area. They say to wait for emergency assistance. There are phone numbers listed that show, or that you know, say to call UCPD. Um, uh, and then also each designated waiting area sign includes the exact, its exact location within a building. Um, so for example, this template that's shown on screen here says your DWA location. Building is an empty space. Floor, there's an empty space. Uh, so it would say something like Wheeler, third floor, Northwest stairwell. Um, and um, that is so that you can tell first responders exactly where you are. Um, if you see that a building you're in is missing this signage, let us know. Email access at breaker.edu and we will make sure it gets put back up there. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Ben. And again, um, some of the terms that Derek had talked about in terms of warn me, text 911, these are emergency notifications um, that will be available to you. Um, and I believe that all staff are getting warn me via email, but you can also do it via your mobile phone. Um, and these, uh, this presentation will be um, emailed to all of you as well. So, and these are all live links as well that you can click to um, once the presentation is over. Um, and then our uh, the next thing is okay. So we've we've gone over what the consultation is going to look like. What does it actually look like to request a consultation? Um, so again, you know, speak with your managers about uh, what the consultation process will look like. Um, but you can always request a consultation on our website, which is um, on our website right now at um, dac.berkeley. Um, I'm sorry, staff.berkeley.edu emergency. Um, and really it's just to capture some logistical information so that we can create a personalized emergency evacuation plan um, as an accommodation for a disability. Um, and again, you know, it's gonna involve knowing the buildings and the floors you're, you're located in on campus, as well as your schedule. I know that during, you know, as, as we're all aware during this um, pandemic, you know, you're not necessarily going to be on campus every day, or, you know, you might have a hybrid program, or you are on campus every day. So um, those are some of the details that are important uh, for, for the people like building managers to know about um, during situations of emergency. Um, and like Derek mentioned, some of this information is also going to be uh, you know, who could be your exit buddy or, you know, who can be your exit buddies during these times, um, as well as making general evacuation prep, like making a to-go bag, learning about the building that you're at, the exits, um, the routes, uh, learning how to, uh, to understand how an evacuation chair would look like um, for people who are in wheelchairs. Um, and kind of thinking about other components that would help, like for individuals who are um, deaf or hard of hearing, having a strobe light at their workstation and um, just wayfinding in general. And so, um, so the process is you'll, where you'll, I'm sorry, fill out this, this um, request for a consultation. You'll get an automatic confirmation email and then, um, will be able to schedule a consultation and to, sh to show you uh, the things that we discussed um, so far, as well as any follow-up that's needed. Okay, Ben, um, can you uh, say a little bit about evacuation chairs? I know that you did a training recently with UCBD. Is there any insight or any information you'd like to share regarding that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking. So. One of, uh, we got a question in the chat actually pretty close to the beginning of this about whether we were working with the Office for Emergency Management. <laughs> um, the, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so 
over the course of a couple of weeks last month, or was it this COVID has done weird things, my perception of time, my apologies. Um, uh, the Office of Emergency Management and I conducted a series of trainings uh, for UCPD officers where we uh, you know, gave them an overview of evacuation wheelchairs. We showed them how to use the chairs and we spoke with them about what our mandates and best practices are for evacuating people with disabilities um, you know, in general, but be they staff, student, guest, visitor, et cetera. Um, so the short version of this is that um, UCPD officers and who are the campus's first responders know that evacuation wheelchairs exist. They know where they are and they know how to get into the cabinets where they are stored and use them. They have been guided in how to approach and request any info from a person who requires evacuation assistance about how to best lift and move them um, and ideally to treat them with the, you know, with equal dignity and respect as they would any other person. They also know that it is a part of our mandate to evacuate mobility devices such as wheelchairs unless it is impossible to do so given other constraints. So for example, after a major earthquake, if there is substantial fear that the building will collapse, the officer might feel that they need to make sure that your life is taken care of before they worry about your wheelchair. Um, however, if there is no constraint, they also know that they must also evacuate mobility devices. Um, and, um, you know, it's also something I tried to impart to UCPD officers as far as emergency evacuation chairs specifically go, that for some people, separation from their wheelchair in and of itself is a substantial risk to safety and life, so that they must take that into consideration as they are asking about how to best evacuate somebody. Um, so um, UCPD uh, should be well equipped to help with that in the future. And they will also notify any additional first responders who come to the scene, for example, Berkeley Fire, um, of what our you know, processes, procedures are and what evacuation wheelchairs are. So, um, yep, I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, uh, ben, Derek, and Thea. I just want to mention that we have 25 minutes left. We did want to allow some time for Q&A. So is it possible to um, wrap up in the next five minutes, the presentation? Yeah. I, I just have one more vignette to talk about, and that's it, and then I'm, I'm finished. OK, and I wasn't sure if Thea was finished. I, yeah, so um, I, it was perfect timing, actually, because I was going to um, to give it back to Derek um, to talk about the vignettes. Got so, it. Thank you. Right. Thank you for prompting us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thea. Um, and the vignette is just a personal experience that sort of highlights the need for the evacuation. So um, about five years ago, I was working in a particular building. And outside of my building, if you open the window, there's a car wash. So there's a lot of noise from the car wash. So um, it's summer, it's hot. So I'm in the office with my fan on. Uh, I'm talking to a complainant because I'm handling an investigation. So I have my door closed. Um, on my head, I have my headset so that I can talk to the person on one ear. On the other ear, I have my, uh, my headset for my computer so that I can hear as my screen reader reads what I'm typing. And, um, and so I'm working along and all of a sudden I hear somebody yell out, UCPD. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of strange. So I go out into the suite area and there's police officers there saying, hey, how are you? And I hear that there's a fire alarm going off and I couldn't hear it because there was so much other noise that was blending and hiding it. Um, and I couldn't thank that UCPD officer enough. There was a fire, there was smoke in the building. But at the end of the day, it was interesting that all of these things were going on. I really could not hear the fire alarm. So of course I go and I gather my things and we, 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 we get out of the building. Um, and so the exit buddy that I was supposed to have just happened to be at lunch. 
So earlier I talked about having a backup exit buddy. And this is one of the reasons why, because the person might be doing something as simple as going to lunch. And this emergency might happen when, when the person's at lunch. So the more active a role we can play in um, building in um, building in supports, the more we can uh, proactively learn about what we need when we need, if we need to evacuate a building, and the more we can contribute to a team approach to uh, successfully evacuating the building, the more successful we will be overall. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Any Derek. Questions? I see a question in the chat from MD Huckle, UCSF Police. Uh, it says, would love to partner to get any information on training for UCPD that can be tailored for San Francisco. Um, yeah, that is, um, that is great. I don't know um, if you are willing to kind of if, reach out to us, um, you know, if you email access at berkeley.edu or, um, or my email address is bperez, B-P-E-R-E-Z at berkeley.edu. And I'd be happy to um, go over those trainings with you. Um, I think um, it is very common for the UCs to take a go it alone kind of approach. And I would love to help support anything we can, especially for UCSF, so, so close to us. And honestly, just such an amazing institution given, given the last 18 to 20 months we've had, I have a lot of respect for everything y'all do, so. Well, thanks, um, happy to help. I, Yeah, I appreciate that. I think one of the biggest things is that we really want to, and of course, emergency management does fall within my purview. I, I do Homeland Security Emergency Management for the enterprise. Um, and specifically, I'm housed within the police department and uh, used to have a similar version when Amina Asafa was with um, Office of Emergency Services for UC Berkeley, and then it moved out into its own um, area. So partnering in that regard, but I love the fact that you're providing some training to the officers and so forth and if, and as you may or may not know wendy tobias is our new um chief of access and disability here at ucss awesome. Congrats. So, um yeah yeah we're thrilled to have her she's a wonderful wonderful partner but we're just getting started with making a more robust effort with our afn or access and functional needs population so um looking forward to like i said getting any um information that we might be able to share. And I think the other the other piece on this, Ben, in particular, is that when we host regents meetings, at, um, you know, every other month and so forth, we do invite other um, UC police divisions or public safety divisions right. to come here. And it would be our pleasure, again, to have an overall um, scope of doing it, just to, even if it's just in time or I... quick training for these folks. I would love to. I think that working on something at the system level makes sense because we are, you know, we're, we are one university. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And, for sure. And I think uh, that would be a really great way to do it. I'm happy to work with you on that. Um, and um, yeah, that'd be great. So thank you again. I appreciate all the work that that was presented here today. So uh, you guys are, are doing well. Thanks. <laughs> doing what we can, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I wonder, um, I have a couple questions, but I wonder if anyone else has a question. Okay, well then I'll just die. Oh, I see Jenny's hand raised. Go ahead, Jenny. Hi, um, so I really appreciate all this training. Um, I've had to hop in and out because of student workers at the library, um, but I've really appreciated this. Um, I kind of have, I, I'm new to this as well. And um, I, one of the questions I'm wondering about the emergency evacuations is like, I work for the chemistry library within Hildebrand, which is controlled by the college chemistry building management. Um, and I'm, I personally have never received any information on like the evacuation chairs or anything like that. And I don't know what like our role would necessarily be in those situations. And if we come to you or would we respond or reach out to like the College of Chemistry first? Um, there's just multiple layers going on there. Um, and I'm speaking for myself, not for the library. I'm just trying to figure this out. But does that question make sense? Yeah. Um, do you guys mind if I take it there, Sophia? Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, OK. So you're absolutely right in that there are a lot of layers 
in operation here. Um, as you're thinking about the students, particularly inside of the library um, and the people who are coming in and out frequently, um, you know, the, the, the building emergency plan function is a, is a Cal OSHA requirement. And it's something that the university is now taking a more systematic look at and making sure that they're all up to date across all of our buildings and programs. As you could imagine, that type of programming is difficult for a university like ours because of you know, the way that staff turnover and other things affect you know, what the specifics of a plan. Um, the building plans are coordinated at the building level first. So the College of Chemistry as a discrete unit should have some sense of its building emergency plans. However, I want to say, and just really plainly recognize that uh, there has not been a, a huge emphasis on the development of these plans recently, because we've been dealing with emergency after emergency year after year, given the smoke years and now COVID. Um, I, so I just want to say, you know, there, there might be less coherent of a building plan than there should be at the moment. Um, that said, again, we have, you know, started to push to make sure that these are updated and make sure that they're brought up to date. But I think that the work starts in the building. So in your case, yes, the College of Chemistry who's responsible for Hildebrand. Um, if, if you ask and you get uh, you don't get anywhere, um, feel free to reach out to us though, because we are really um, spearheading this effort because although you know, emergency planning affects everybody, um, you know, we want to make sure that the emergency plans that exist are very, well situated to take care of the needs of our staff and community members more broadly with disabilities. Um, first and foremost, I guess. Thank you. That's really helpful to have a direction to go in. Maybe I'll ask my question now. Um, so it seems like with the emergency evacuations, there's a lot of knowledge that someone has to have in order to know where to go, who to talk to, have all this advanced, you know, advanced planning and systems in place. And I'm just wondering for someone who um, is a visitor to campus only there one time, what what resources are they like, how are they going to be taken care of is my question, like who's going to look out for them? That's a, you know, that's a really daunting challenge and, and a really important question to ask. Um, I think the short answer is that we need to rely on the cues that we have in the built environment because those are the first things that somebody is gonna interact with that might help them respond, right? That is to say the signage that exists needs to be up to date, needs to show where the emergency features are, um, and that's why we're starting with the sign. Why, you know, why, why I'm starting with signage is a big program for the campus, because if the symbols look the same in every building, it lowers the barrier, like the cognitive barrier, I think, for people to understand what they're interacting with when they look at emergency evacuation routes information inside of the buildings. Um, then it falls on our building emergency plans as a whole. You know, they are to include provisions for anybody who's there. Um, be they somebody really familiar with campus or somebody unfamiliar. That said, our office is always available, especially for people with disabilities to get, you know, some, some lightning quick resources if they are going to be on campus and have significant concern in that area. But I would say, unfortunately, the built environment first, the signage and the other material there has to be, it has to, you know, describe the needs of people with disabilities and then it also has to be you know, it has to have the programming in place, like the evacuation wheelchairs, to actually manage those needs if an emergency, or let me rephrase that, when an emergency happens. Got it. In, a, in, a, in addition, I would add um, communications. Is, communication is still critical up front. So um, if a person is in a building and there's an emergency and they uh, are able to get to a designated waiting area, there's communications that are available in that area. Uh, for them to be able to reach out to emergency responders. Um, if they have 
the the um, they can call 911. They can call text 911, text to 911. Excuse me. Um, they can send an email. So so part of it is also uh, in addition to the signage. There's also things that they can do to prepare early to ensure that they have emergency contact information to be able to reach someone. But I think if, if there is an, an evacuation that's necessary and the person is unable to use the stairs, or the, um, then getting to that designated waiting area and using one of our communication phone lines uh, in addition to a smartphone would be a, a definitely a good first step. Great. I mean, and I'm thinking if someone is sight impaired and they can't read signage, and then what recourse do they have? So, you know, that's... So I think we all have the obligation to, to have both audible, mm -hmm. visual, and uh, certainly touch it, when we can for yep. any emergency response. And what, what I want to say is that when we have faculty, staff, and, and learners here on site, every one of them is taught that we have an obligation to any of our visitors or their families coming that if there is an emergency action like an evacuation or a fire alarm going off, that they have the responsibility to foster them through our system because we can't have the ultimate expectation that people will know our buildings. Um, we know our buildings best, right? So it's training our folks that what happens in an emergency, well, they need to know the Cal OSHA piece is that they need to know how to contact um, and you know emergency responders by calling 911 or whatever other mechanism that there is to, to use. And then second to that is they need to know how to evacuate from the building and that includes Again, if you are having a visitor in your environment or a, a family, so because again, we're an academic medical center, that they right. can foster that individual through our, uh, our own emergency response. Yep. S similarly, yeah. um, um, with, with the uh, rollout of the self-evaluation education, um, the staff will be notified that uh, that, that obligation and responsibility will be highlighted because emergency evacuation is one of the requirements of ADA Title II guidelines. So each unit that goes through training will be exposed to information that notifies them of their obligation to be of assistance. Well, great question. Yeah, I think yeah. that um, just to share one last piece is that I think by the nature of our office, um, we need to have partnerships all over campus. And so I think that part of that is the training component of really, you know, working with like parking and transportation, for example, working with, um, I think as Eric mentioned, working with uh, the, these units to, to train up. And so that it, it's just not, um, it ends up not being just one office or one call center that is responsible for that. That's a very good point. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Question just came in the chat that was, do we coordinate with UCPD on the directions given by loudspeakers on campus during an emergency? Um, the short answer is no, not specifically. However, um, during a critical emergency function, um, Ella Callow, who is our department director is one of the people in the room uh, in the emergency command center. I don't remember the acronym used on campus because I'm very sorry. Um, but um, but that, so there is direction given at that high level. Yeah, EOC, thank you so much. Um, that was it. Um, and so, you know, um, Ella is present at the EOC in order to help guide the general directions and the general planning um, as the emergency unfolds. Um, and so, you know, the loudspeaker messages are largely pre recorded, although they can be delivered live, which to me sounds both amazingly fun and kind of intimidating. Um, but either way, um, you know, so there is somebody there helping to steer the campus's efforts in two directions that will hopefully meet and exceed the base needs of, of the disabled community members who are on campus when, when something happens. And I wanted to add one other point. Um, I'm sorry that this wasn't included in the actual bulk of the presentation, but 
we have Knox boxes. And so if you are a person with a disability and you are in a particular building, you can request that um, a card be placed, a laminated card be placed in a Knox box so that first responders can identify quickly what floor you're on, uh, what build, you know, when they get to the building, what floor you're on and what room you're in. Now, we intend to have a process by which once a consultation is completed, uh, we will be sharing information with OEM as well as UCPD so that that information is available on a spreadsheet, but it, it never hurts to have a, an extra um, uh, control in the process. So uh, if you're in a building on campus and you have an evacuation plan, specifically request that the information about where you're located be placed in the Knox box. Now, uh, obviously the responsibility is to change that if you move to another building, but ideally we want to have that extra uh, physical uh, identification of where you are in case the electricity is out, for example, and they can't read the Google Doc. Um, so um, that's definitely a point to, to reiterate. And I see a comment from um, MD Heckel. UCPD also has the ability to broadcast by intercom to the general public from their patrol cars. Oh, wow. And yeah. So the patrol cars can't remember, they can't reach every location. It's only really their ability to get in and out in, in a general sense. Um, we do have these small intercoms within every one of our PD locations that are portable, but again, it's not um, addressing, let's say if there's a large scale earthquake, there you will not may not have that in every area. Got it. Well. My comment again would be it'd be really great to have some sort of video or PDF or both with just like this information and a kind of a snapshot for visitors if we don't already have something along those lines. So maybe that can be a future. Um, yeah. Well, we do, we do actually have um, a working. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to oh. interrupt you. Um, we do have a, a public. Um, Hand, handout that um, that has a lot of this information on it. And I've also uh, put, there's a link on our presentation as well um, that we'll uh, distribute to everyone. Um, but it, it does have a lot of this information and, you know, as well right now it's on a Google doc. And so if there are any issues ac uh, assessing or accessing, the document, please just let us know. Um, that's that's unfortunately often how uh, all of us find out if if something isn't as as accessible as we we think it is. Right. So. I mean, I'm just thinking. So, I work at the School of Public Health, and we're actually putting on an event shortly where there will be a lot of elderly folks, and I'm assuming that yep. many of them will have disabilities, and so does our event yeah. coordinator. Is our events co coordinator aware of all of this? I don't know. They should be. So. Uh... Oh, you froze, Ben. <laughs> yeah, they should be, and and of course they can reach out to our office. But one of the other, I mean, you're 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 one of the other things that um, need to be know, covered. It, it, uh, oh, go ahead, Ben. You back? Okay. He's not back. Yeah, I'm back. I'm so sorry. Oh. I was just going to cover that in, um, in the events training um, that has to take place with the self-evaluation that includes educating event sponsors and event coordinators about emergency evacuation. Go ahead, Ben. Um, our, yeah, I would say our, our website also includes, um, you know, event accessibility guidelines that um, my understanding is that event sponsors are required to take a look at and acknowledge if they're posting events to the Berkeley events calendar. Um, and my apologies, my video is now going to be off. My internet is unstable. Go Air Bears. <laughs> and um, I'm struggling, I just, struggling right now. I Jenny just has her hand right now. Oh, oh yeah. I was just real quickly, I just wanted um, folks to know that I just put in the chat the um, public document for um, emergency evacuation planning um, in the chat. So let me know if that also doesn't work, but it should be public. Um, awesome. Uh, Jenny? Oh. Jenny? Yeah, go ahead, Jenny. Um, I don't know if this question is kind of outside of 
what's being discussed or not, but I'm wondering about persons who have psychiatric disabilities or are neurotypical and if there are any trainings for how to assist them in emergency evacuation. Um, I can imagine someone who doesn't want to be touched or is sensing noise or things like that. Um, they have some different difficulties in emergencies and um, are there any guidelines around that? So th the short answer is no. However, that is because we are assuming that those types of considerations are best made in an individual consultation right now, because we need, because, because of how, you know, how specific some of those triggers can be that could cause acute distress, we really need to focus on working with making sure that, you know, first responders definitely need to know to, you know, maybe ask if somebody has any specific considerations during an evacuation, but then really working with the individual with those needs to make sure they can most effectively, you know, and ideally even in under a lot of duress, find some way of communicating that information or to otherwise, you know, help manage their own, you know, what they imagine will be their, their response in a really triggered and very troubling environment, right? So that's, we, I think we're focusing on it right now through the lens of that individual consultation, um, which, you know, I, I can see definitely doesn't cover, you know, somebody who doesn't have the time bandwidth or knowledge to seek out that consultation. But hopefully, um, we will be able to, you know, make it, this service so broadly available that people know. And that's kind of our intention. Yeah, and, and also, what, like Ben was saying, I want to emphasize, there's also the, the script the information that a person can provide to uh, early re first responders um, that helps them understand what particular considerations might need to be taken into account um, in, in case of an emergency. So there's there's a, an opportunity for communication to take place with that. Uh, if it's a person who's uh, a staff person, uh, obviously just the functional limitations, not the disability, um, can be described in a way that the, the, the supervisor manager understands. Uh, another secondary protocol would be the exit buddy that the person uh, works with can also be apprised of what, um, uh, what assistance um, the individual might need in order to successfully um, 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 respond to emergencies. So there's a number of things that we can build in um, in, in the consultation that will assist in um, providing the sort of safe uh, safety that we need. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it is 11.59. All right. Yep. Well, and thank you to the thank Alliance you. for having us. Indeed. Yeah, thank you for staying with us for so long. <laughs> So informative. Just really appreciate everything that you shared. And, um, you know, please, anyone who is, a, you know, wants to check out the Alliance uh, webpage, I pop that in the chat and um, we can connect you with the, the speakers if needed. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.